Hi, I'm Darren and welcome to Level Up Double Elam. I'm starting a new multi-part series today. I'll be building an HF transmitter. Well, let's get to it. If you're one of my regular viewers, you'll certainly recognize this simple amateur radio receiver that I built over a 10 episode series, and it needs a companion. It needs a transmitter to go with it. Now, like the first few episodes in that series, I spend time talking about design, going through calculations, block diagrams, simulations, before I get into building hardware, and I'm going to follow the same pattern here, starting with block diagrams. Let's dive right in with a block diagram of my concept. I'm not showing everything, just the major elements. And just like the receiver, there's really nothing earth shattering that I'm doing here. Two of my main goals are to put to use some of the good parts from my junk box in order to keep the overall costs down and to reuse proven circuit designs to avoid spending excessive time in trial and error. And this design helps me achieve both of those goals. It's a very common double superhet design. The first frequency conversion occurs here in a balanced modulator to get to an intermediate frequency of 5.5 MHz. I'll explain that choice later when I get to the first bandpass filter. The second frequency conversion happens here in the second mixer and follows a conventional approach to combine the 5.5 MHz intermediate frequency with a VFO signal to get to the desired transmission frequency. Notice that I'm using an Arduino Nano and an SI5351 clock generator module. That combo worked very well for my simple receiver project, so no reason to deviate from success. The other elements are pretty unremarkable. I'll comment more on them later, but first I want to describe the frequency plan for this transmitter. I'm showing in this table all 10 of the HF bands that my receiver covers, but note several exceptions that I will not include in the transmitter. In particular, I have no need to build a transmitter that can cover the 160 meter and 80 meter bands for one simple reason. There's absolutely no way I can build an antenna, a dipole, a vertical, or otherwise, at my location to transmit on those bands. So those are out. I'm also excluding the 60 meter band because its frequencies are just too close to the 5.5 MHz IF frequency to work, and also the same issue as 160 and 80, no antenna. 30 meters is out because it's just too small and it's got no phone spectrum, so it's not worth the effort. So that leaves six bands at 40 meters and up, which is plenty of spectrum for me. These columns here show the VFO frequencies that I'll need to inject into the second mixer to cover the band frequency spread. For 20 meters and all other upper side band bands, I'll be using high side injection and the sum of the VFO and IF frequencies to get to the transmission frequency. For lower sideband transmission on 40 meters, I'm still using high side injection, but will use the difference between the VFO and IF frequencies instead. More on why in a moment. Let's take a more detailed look at how I'm generating an upper sideband signal using 20 meters as an example. Now, if you've seen my episode on the frequency plan for my simple receiver, this will look familiar. If not, go watch it because I'm only going to cover the highlights here. The balance modulator will output both a non-inverted upper sideband signal and an inverted lower sideband signal centered at 5.5 MHz. I'll use the first bandpass filter to only pass the non-inverted upper sideband signal and reject the lower sideband signal. The second mixer will then combine the 5.5 MHz upper sideband IF frequency with the VFO frequency to create the transmitted frequency. A second bandpass filter will pass the sum but reject the difference, which prevents the difference from showing up as a significant spurious output. And because I'm using the sum, the spectrum is not inverted. The scheme for 40 meters is slightly different only because I need a lower side band, not an upper side band. I'm keeping the first bandpass filter unchanged, which means I need to invert the spectrum in the second mixer to flip it to lower side band. That's easily accomplished by just choosing an appropriate VFO frequency such that the difference between it and the IF gives me the desired transmission frequency. And because I'm using high side injection and using the difference product, the spectrum ends up naturally inverted, just what I wanted. And just like for 20 meters, a second bandpass filter rejects the other mixer product, the sum in this case. 
Jumping back now to the first bandpass filter, it needs to have a very narrow bandwidth, only a few kilohertz and sharp drop-off skirts in order to adequately reject the lower sideband. The filter that I'm planning to use here is actually a mystery commercial filter from my junk box. I say mystery because I've had no luck in positively decoding the text printed on it. I don't even remember how I got it. It likely was in a grab bag of old parts that I bought online. It's likely a crystal filter on the inside. The most significant clue to its performance is this line of text right here. That could mean a 5.5 MHz center frequency with a bandwidth of 2.7 kHz. A great way to find out would be to put it on a network analyzer, so that's exactly what I did, and, sure enough, that guess was pretty close. Judging by the response curve, it looks like it's intended to work as an upper sideband filter with a carrier frequency of 5.5 MHz and provide a passband of 2.7 kHz. I make that conclusion because I'm referring to the carrier frequency placement method from Chapter 6 in Experimental Methods for RF Design. To use that method, you first determine the frequency at which the skirt is 6 dB down from the passband, then move an additional 300 Hz further down the skirt to place the carrier frequency. Using my calibrated eye to examine the lower skirt, if I follow this method, then I end up placing the carrier frequency at 5.5 MHz, and for sure that jives with the text printed on the filter. So that's what I'll go with here. I can also make a rough judgment on sideband suppression from this response data. This solid red line here represents the 5.5 MHz carrier frequency placement. To the right and to the left of it, I'm showing the sum and difference products that will come out of the balance modulator and go to the filter input. I want the filter to pass only the sum, which is the upper sideband, and reject the difference, which is the lower sideband. I can get an estimate of the worst case lower sideband rejection by offsetting 300 hertz to the left of the carrier frequency. That's this dashed blue line here. 300 hertz is a decent assumption for the lowest frequency component of significant intensity in normal human speech. The blue dot here represents where the 300 hertz offset line intersects the skirt response. Again, using my calibrated eye, the magnitude difference from the filter passband to the dot is approximately 30 dB. And 30 dB is an acceptable minimum rejection for the unwanted sideband. Now keep in mind, the rejection only gets better as the speech frequency increases due to the steepness of the filter tail. By the time you get to the 1 kHz speech components, for example, the rejection is over 60 dB from the filter passband. So effectively, I've just confirmed what's probably obvious. This commercial filter is clearly appropriate for filtering out a sideband, and that's good. It gives me a head start on this transmitter design and saves having to design and fabricate a precise crystal filter from scratch. Returning now to the block diagram, let me touch on the remaining elements. I've added some component names, power levels, and relative gains that I'm targeting for each stage. This section here, from the audio amp to the balance modulator, will be a modified version of figure 6.102 from EMRFD. Instead of an LM741, I'll use instead a dual LM358 to provide amplification and some active low-pass filtering. That'll drive the very common and inexpensive MC1496 balanced modulator, which in turn feeds the first bandpass filter that I described a moment ago. Next, I need an IF amplifier to boost the signal to feed the ADE1, which is the same mini circuits mixer that I used in my receiver. The VFO comes from the SI5351, and I'm showing a buffer amp in between them. Not sure I'll need it, but for now, I've included it. I'm also showing a separate carrier oscillator for CW mode. A second stage of bandpass filtering is needed to remove the unwanted mixer products. Now these filters will be duplicates of the ones in my receiver, meaning that they'll be tuned LC networks. They don't need to be as sharp as the first bandpass filter. And just like in my receiver, I'll need to make them modular and switchable. The preamp will bring the RF up to about plus 27 dBm, or 500 milliwatts, which then feeds into the final power amp. That'll use the very common IRF510 MOSFETs in a push-pull design. That approach has seen wide use in multiple variations. 
Perhaps the most well-known implementation is in the HF Packer amp kit that was made several years ago by Virgil Stamps, amateur call sign K500R. But prior to Virgil's version, you can find this design in the EMRFD book and going even further back. But despite its age, it's still a solid choice for getting moderate levels of RF power. The IRF 510s are still readily available and are pretty cheap. That's a big advantage over many historical RF transistors and FETs. It's also well documented and its shortcomings are well characterized. Output power is around 35 watts on 40 meters and declines to around 20 watts for 10 meters, so it's definitely more than QRP and should be adequate power for making QSOs in this new solar cycle. And lastly, of course, I'll need switchable low-pass filtering to knock down any spurious emissions. There's a wealth of well-proven designs out there for those, so I just need to pick an architecture and run with it. The final topic I want to discuss in this episode is the controls, including the Arduino. I want this transmitter to be usable in two modes that I'll refer to as Captain Mode and Minion Mode. I'll start with Minion Mode. In this mode, the transmitter will be connected to my simple receiver and take commands from it to set the transmission frequency and the transmission mode. The user controls will be disabled. That makes the receiver and transmitter into a coordinated pair and makes operation just as transparent as would be a transceiver. Or for example, like the old Drake T4 reciter paired with an R4A receiver. Getting my simple receiver to communicate with the Arduino and the transmitter will be done over an RS-232 interface. Of course, it's possible to use the I2C interface to communicate between Arduinos, but it's not a smart idea to expose the micro inputs and outputs outside the shielded environment of the case, especially with stray RF and ESD. It's much more robust to use an extra hardware layer like RS-232. Of course, that means I'll have to modify my simple receiver hardware to add the RS-232 interface and modify the software accordingly, but that's not going to be too difficult. Captain mode is the opposite, meaning the transmitter will work independently of the receiver and the user will have control over the transmission frequency and the transmission modes. This will let me use this transmitter with any receiver of my choice. My AirSpy HF Plus SDR, for example, or even one of my old tube receivers like my Drake R4A. It also will let me operate split frequency, which is a good feature, but I don't see myself needing to use that much. And one more comment on the Arduino. I'm showing it driving an SI5351 clock generator for both the carrier signal and the VFO signal. I don't really need a clock generator for the carrier. It's a fixed 5.5 MHz frequency, so I might change that to be a simple crystal oscillator. Also, given the fact that genuine SI5351 boards are almost unobtainable at the moment, I may have to go with something else, like the AD9850. That's all I have for the intro episode. Thanks for sticking with me through some pretty dry technical material, but I hope you got something out of it. And for sure, if you have any questions or comments about the approach I'm planning to take, you know the drill. Leave them in the comments below. Now looking ahead to the next episode, I hope to have all the detailed circuitry uh, design work complete and maybe an LT spice simulation or two of some of the sub-circuits so I can check out and show the performance. So as always, thanks very much for watching my channel, and until next time, bye for now.